the weather classroom. Because we live at the bottom of a sea of air, we see the atmosphere behave much like the bottom of any sea, with swirling currents and everything. Now the sun's heat is the origin of all the weather that happens in our atmosphere, because it causes air masses to warm and circulate. That movement creates differences in air pressure, and that makes wind. But there's all different kinds of wind. So let's check in with our own wind bag, Brandon, and get the real scoop. Explorers have sailed around the world on tall ships like this for generations. With pretty primitive instruments, they figured out the ocean currents and charted their course into the great unknown. Just as important as ocean currents, though, were the currents above the water. And if you wanted to get to where you were going on one of these ships, you had to know how the wind moved. The most predictable of the winds are what we still call today the prevailing winds. Prevailing winds blow in the same direction most of the time. Check this out. The Earth rotates from west to east, and at the equator, it spins at 1,000 miles per hour. But at the poles, it doesn't turn at all. The difference in rotation speed causes air to be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. This is called the Coriolis effect. Trade winds are probably the most famous prevailing winds. They blow toward the equator from the northeast and southeast. When wind was the only power that moved ships around the world, trade and exploration moved along the paths of these trade winds. And because trade winds have basically the same path summer and winter, the sailors could predict which way these tall ships would go. If you have local land features like a mountain range or a beach and mix it with differences in air pressure or temperature, you have local wind. If you live in California, you've probably heard of the Santa Ana winds. Or, if you're from the Rockies, you probably know of Chinooks. But wherever you live, wind is a major part of the weather machine. Well, local winds are really any wind that occurs in a small area, what we would call a mesoscale area, because anything that, like a city or a mountain or even a lake or the ocean can cause winds to blow differently in that, right in that area. And so we would call that a local wind. The sea breeze is a breeze that comes from the sea. Meteorologists like to talk about winds in the direction they come from. So a west wind is not a wind that's going toward the west. It's coming out of the west. It's from the west. And so a sea breeze is a wind that blows from the sea. And a sea breeze will occur on a clear, sunny day when there's no other strong weather system around the wind starts blowing in from the sea to replace the warm air that's rising over the land. The land warms more quickly and that air is rising and the high pressure air out over the ocean moves in to replace it. So people flock to the beach to experience the nice cool weather there with the breeze coming in off the sea. Well there's actually lots of strong local winds as well and a strong local wind that lots of people have experienced are the kinds that blow near mountain ranges and they're strong downslope windstorms. They occur in California and they're called Santa Ana's and all along the Rocky Mountains, they're frequently referred to as Chinooks. And these are actually wind storms that can reach over 100 miles per hour. We know that wind helps make weather, and sometimes it can cause all kinds of trouble. Over the ages, people have combined their brain power with wind power and put wind to work. Well, here at the National Wind Technology Center, we do research on wind energy technology to improve wind turbines, like you see behind me here, to reduce electricity that can be competitive with fossil fuels. The Wind Technology Center was built here along the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado because of the excellent variation of winds that we experience here. I think you can see behind me the gap in the mountains. The winds funnel through there, and in the winter, we often get winds over 100 miles an hour, which is excellent for testing wind turbines. Wind turbines have been used for years. They used to be called windmills. They were used to grind grain, pump water for wells, or to uh, hold the water back from uh, the Netherlands, for instance. And more recently, they've been used all across America um, before there was electricity and large electricity grids. We're interested in using wind energy because it provides us an alternate source of electricity. It's, it'll extend our fossil fuel usage well into the future. Wind will always blow. It's renewable. We don't have to worry about using it up. And I think that 
people are concerned about the environment and the future of our planet, and we have children, and we want to make sure that they have electricity uses for their future as well. The upper regions of the atmosphere were a new frontier for 19th century meteorologists. They figured out that the air up there held the key to a more complete understanding of the behavior of our weather. So they perched their observatories as high as they could on mountaintops. Others put hot air to the test in balloons. When airplanes were invented, explorers could move faster and higher than ever before. On April Fool's Day, 1960, scientists loaded up a spacecraft with cameras and instruments and blasted Tiros 1 into orbit. For the first time, we got to see satellite pictures of the Earth showing land masses and cloud covers. Now, we could get readings and observations from above the Earth's atmosphere. Dry land. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we're home. So, that's it for my voyage. Atmospheric exploration has come a long way, and we're always learning more. And as long as there are explorers like all of you out there, who knows what we'll discover up there in the sea of air. Later. Our atmosphere is amazing. We breathe it, we fly in it, we watch clouds go floating through it on a summer day. It even protects us from meteors and deadly radiation. It's billions of years in the making, and basically, it makes life worth living here on planet Earth. Kind of makes you wonder why we'd go on polluting it. But there's always hope. By studying and understanding the sky above us, explorers and scientists just like you will figure out how to return the favor and protect the sea of air that is our atmosphere. For the Weather Classroom, I'm Jocelyn. See you next time.